So today we're going to talk about uh, how to do static analysis uh, in a world where we have better and better uh, virtualization, emulation, all kinds of fancy patching, hooking. Uh, it's, it's been an awesome conference of all kinds of new tools. Uh, so if you like static analysis of just staring into a screen uh, with nothing else going on and no like, you know, no debugger, um, we're going to talk about a part of the world where that's still a thing and will continue to be a thing for a long time. And I'm going to talk about some tools I tried to write, uh, making use of some of the new uh, partial emulation tooling that's been coming out of the likes of uh, Anger, Bincat, uh, BAP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, first of all, we should start off with like, why would anybody still do static analysis in a world with nice tools? Um, it's a big world. Uh, Let's look at the typical like supply chain uh, for firmware. Um, and this is going to be a bit messy, but I think the important thing is to recognize that like somewhere on the left, uh, that's a silicon vendor. And they have a bunch of like black magic and formal methods and specifications and hardware that has no bugs whatsoever. Uh, but you never get to see any of that. All you get is the actual silicon that gets shipped out on dies and some reference manuals that were written by technical writers, and then some board support packages that were, who knows who wrote them. Um, and then from that, there is a long process to build up tools, to port operating systems, compilers, libraries, uh, until eventually all this hardware shows up that actually integrates the silicon. Uh, and if you look at the right devices uh, and the right uh, components, uh, there's a lot of like supply chain once you actually have people building modules and integrating those modules into other devices uh, until eventually some kind of box shows up somewhere doing something interesting. Um, and in that world, uh, you know, the main box might eventually be doing things with, you know, PowerPC or x86 or what have you, uh, but there's like, there's got to be a co-co-co-co-processor somewhere uh, that is challenging and fun. Uh, and I think fun is one of the main motivators for interesting uh, security analysis, uh, and I think it's important to keep this in mind uh, when like motivating yourself to do really boring and uh, occasionally unrewarding work for long periods of time, uh, which static analysis tends to be. Um, so uh, just just to like set the base for like what my expectations for the tools are, uh, the, the process that I expect uh, a lot of devices will need, um, a lot of targets will need is, uh, you know, compared to a typical Internet of Things Linux box on insert semi-popular but not like x86 popular architecture here, um, it, it's fairly, like, repeatable in that you, you dump it, you find some vulns, you exploit those vulns, you have a shell, it's POSIX, um, you know, it's less featureful POSIX, whatever, it works, you can do admin stuff with it and you have control. Uh, if you try to apply the same methodology to like a lower level device, an architecture is poorly documented, has no standardized operating system, uh, the vendor is, you know, in another country, speaks another language, possibly is on the moon, um, it gets a little bit weirder uh, because these second two steps, uh, they're not repeatable across devices uh, because every time you have something new and stupid and strange. Uh, so if you want to like get better at this by building tooling, um, you have to get better at the, like, extracting code and analyzing code steps uh, with fairly little information about the rest of the system, because remembering the supply chain, um, by the time something interesting shows up in your parking meter and you decide you can hack this parking meter, um, it's been a long time, uh, and you're starting from a position with very little knowledge where there's this fog of war uh, around you, and the more you look at the little hints you have, the more information you will have uh, but there is a stage where like your entry point is a binary you dumped out of some SPI chip or downloaded from some vendor's website. Uh, you don't know what it runs on. You don't know which stage of bootloading it's for. Um, all you have is like a fancy hex editor uh, and a bunch of binary code. Um, and that's fun, and that's what we're going for. So with that in mind, um, let's take a look at the kind of... Uh, objectives and like what what um, what we need and what we want and uh, th this is the part where you have to like stick to a tool chain that you like and enjoy uh, and like are familiar with um, because there's there's a lot of like 
there's a bunch of stuff written in Python, there's a bunch of stuff written in OCaml. Um, depending on your skill set, uh, you should use what you are familiar with and good at. Uh, so for this talk, I'm going to be trying to focus on techniques that are applicable to multiple tool chains that all focus on the same stuff. Uh, but I will be using examples from Binary Ninja and Python code that I wrote because uh, it was fun. This is like a fun project. And uh, that's what I stuck with. It was not necessarily the best choice, but um, choose better uh, if you can. Uh, so um, without further ado, uh, like we're looking to expand our information about some chunk of firmware uh, or software we pulled out of somewhere. And it's like a feedback loop. And when we start automating parts of that feedback loop, uh, our main concern is we automate too much uh, and we start filling our like precious IDP, if we're using IDA, where we're collecting our information and painstakingly documenting it, uh, was just complete garbage. So the like false positives, uh, causing more, more false positives uh, in your analysis uh, and causing it to mark up more and more code incorrectly um, is like the worst case scenario. So any tools we build should try to avoid that. Uh, and the like under approximation case where you have some analysis, you have to keep it rerunning uh, because you keep finding edge cases that your analysis didn't cover before uh, or you keep discovering more code and it doesn't automatically run on new code so you have to rerun it over your entire thing. Um, that's annoying, but that's like a secondary concern. Uh, there's going to be a lot of annoying things. So the last thing is uh, kind of related to the second one and it only like annoys you once and once what happens to you once, it never happens to you again because you learn. Uh, but that's the uh, whoops, I overwrote like so many hours of work uh, with the script that I just ran without thinking. Um, you start taking more backups and writing better scripts. Uh, but when you have a lot of underestimated, uh, under approximating analyses, uh, this is a problem that you have to be careful with um, and make sure your analysis scripts never stomp anything you manually mark up. Um, so, what are we looking for as far as analysis if we're talking about like a, a target we know very little about? We have like basically no data sheets, no understanding what necessarily it even runs on. Uh, if we got it out of some like random driver uh, on a host machine, for example, that's poking bytes into something. And we look at it and we're like, well, maybe it's MIPS, maybe it's something else. Let's dump it into IDA and find out. Um, we're actually super not ambitious with our automated analysis at that point. We just want like accurate disassembly for the architecture at hand, uh, accurate control flow. Even if we can't compute where the control flow goes, just knowing where a uh, IP uh, instruction pointer like transfer occurs. Um, and then like sometimes for some architectures, especially some of the uh, more uh, legacy like 8-bit ones, uh, we might want nice constant propagation. Um, so this is if you have something like uh, gigantic switch statements that just decrement the thing and you want to know what branch of the switch statement you're in. Um, so, uh, other example that we probably want that is like extremely specific to this kind of case is a nice uh, structure markup, um, which is like the basically like the fancy switch statement case. And this is for things like you know if you're looking at a network device, um, network card thing, um, like AT command tables are the closest thing to a symbol table you will ever have. So. Uh, unless there, there's like a telnet interface on it or something or a serial console. Um, structs are important, structs are huge. Uh, if we can automate the recovery, discovery of structs, uh, that would be useful. Uh, but this is like in the ambitious maybe category. Um, so examples of shenanigans uh, our lifter will have to deal with as we add semantic uh, knowledge to our architecture. Um, there's, there's kind of two categories. There's the ones that you can't really fix, uh, or well, there's the ones you can ignore uh, because they are very tied to system code. So things that you are not going to lift but are going to break your analysis. Uh, so in particular, anything involving sharing a memory bus with other things that mess with your registers so that they're volatile, with your memory so that it's volatile. Um, and ideally, we just want to like be able to tag that during analysis and then ignore that part of the firmware until we absolutely have to look at it and look at it at a higher level. Um, but you know, if not, uh, some part of the firmware analysis is going to be broken, that's all right. The bigger problem that affects us as we write tools uh, for you know, random architectures that show up and suddenly we want to port it to you know, insert your preferred tool du jour um, is mapping the abstractions of the architecture to the processor that is being simulated by your tooling. So in Binary Ninja, you've got the LLIL, uh, which 
uh, you know, currently, for now, uh, assumes a flat memory space and, uh, you know, if you're doing register aliasing, suddenly your IL is not nearly uh, as nice because if you don't use registers and you use memory accesses, um, it's no longer quite as simple. Um, you know, it, if, if you can't get calling conventions working, uh, you, you can't analyze data flows between functions as well. Um, you know, if it assumes a C stack model, but you can't get your calling conventions to map to a C stack model, regardless of how hard you try, um, there's, there's a lot of like trade-offs like that that show up because there's a mis mismatch, impedance mismatch between the tool you're trying to simulate partially, the semantics of the architecture in, and the actual architecture. So, uh, examples of this, uh, I'm going to skim through this because I don't want to force people to read 8051, but just focusing on the high-level problems of abstraction mapping and like system stuff that we want to just ignore as long as possible um, until we have like a debugger on the thing. Um, so, the things like bank switching. Um, if you're lifting to an IL or IR for the purpose of visual inspection ever, or if you want to pattern match on that IR, you probably don't want to have it introduce branches uh, every time you access a register based on the content of another register. Um, so like 8051 has the bank switching for R0 through R7, uh, but also some extensions of it, uh, bank switch D pointer, uh, and they bank switch it in such a way that they uh, break the semantics of increment as well, where increment there is being used to flip the low bit of that register, because uh, the second lowest bit is set to zero. So the carry never propagates, uh, but you know, ink and deck do roughly the same thing in that case. Um, so if you're looking at that extension, you have to look at it visually and be like, hey, this is weird. I need to figure out what this is. I need to look up what this register is, and then manually fix up your lifter. Um, because this is not the kind of thing you can automatically detect and warn on uh, unless you know you're going to run into that architecture. Um, other examples. So this is just a typical memory mapped I.O. where it's writing to a memory location repeatedly and doing ISR uh, and uh, uh, flag stuff around it. Um, you know, it's fairly harmless in this case. Um, memory mapping in general, uh, if your tools assume a flat memory map, uh, it can be tricky to do things with hardware architectures or things that change their memory map during execution for the parts of execution you care about. Um, this is an example of a memory map for 8051. Uh, and you notice that there's a trade-off in that uh, I believe that code is not mapped to zero. Ah, okay, in this case. But basically, whatever maps at the zero segment, if there's a lot of lifting you have to do for memory operations. Uh, it's going to be a lot easier to write those if you don't have to keep adding a constant offset to remap it to the virtual memory of your processor. Um, that gets annoying quickly, uh, but everything else is going to have to like, have complicated lifting. And in the current version, your pointers are going to be broken um, unless you like add a second architecture. Anyway, it's, it's weird. Um, moving on, not only is memory in the hardware a concern, uh, if you have a architecture that requires a lot of support to get C actually working on it, uh, you might run into C memory model issues, which on 8051 involves tagged pointers that are 24 bits. Um, so C has its own idea of what the uh, you know, top eight bits of a pointer mean when they point to code. Um, maybe you want to optimize for that in your lift. Maybe not. I have not. I have not tried it yet. Um, that's like a design choice as you're writing a lifter for an architecture. Um, additionally, there's a lot of stuff for compiler intrinsic support, uh, for compiler-wide integer support, for example, uh, where you end up having to basically hot patch your lifted code to like lift intrinsics at the high level if you have uh, data flow that is going outside of a function, and it's like a really core thing. Uh, so like the same thing to do is basically inline the function. Uh, that this is not super easy to understand. This one is easier, where there's like a next door pointer call, uh, but that the IL is just being lifted to uh, three register assignments. Um, and these are like stupid tricks that you end up hav having to gather. Um, and this is like the absolute worst case where there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. But um, to start, uh, the last two instructions before the ret uh, change the upper half of memory to point somewhere else by writing to basically GPI opens. So by setting port pins, this is doing a jump for anything in the upper half of memory. Fortunately, this is running in the lower half of memory. Uh, and it's also using a return to do a call and also push, pushing a return address to restore the upper page of memory. Um, 
Anyway, uh, and it's also a tail call trampoline that has a ton of entry points, so that sucks. Um, th this sucks to write. Uh, this sucks to write if you take the cross product of every uh, interesting binary analysis tool that gets released that like looks cool uh, and every architecture you want to look at. Um, that gets unsustainable fast. So what we would like is some kind of process to like get faster at the initial tool bring up when you need to do static analysis and you have no like emulation whatsoever. Um, and you have some nice tools that potentially can solve problems for you. So the, the basic workflow I'm going for here is that you have a binary and a typical disassembler, uh, but then after the disassembler, there's the semantic uh, extraction, uh, there, there's a semantic uh, spec for what some of the instructions do. And based on that semantic spec, on the intermediate representation you left out of it that's common, you have a bunch of common auto-analysis tools. And so this describes like a ton of stuff, BAP, Binge, et cetera. Uh, but the important thing is like the, the lifter is the hard part and it's the tedious part. Uh, it gets old really fast. So we want to do some like quality assurance uh, on the lifter code we were writing to have less bugs and run into less of the like type one failure of having your code turning into an uh, automated garbage cannon that uh, breaks your IDBs and fills them with incorrect data. Um, so uh, possible ways to do this. Uh, can we just fuzz the thing? Like it's a security conference, right? That's the answer to everything? Um, answer is probably. Um, so like, if you can find a reference manual, uh, you might be able to find emulators. And like, they might not be exactly for the hardware you have, but the cores are, there's not that many cores in the world. And like, emulators are a plausible thing to discover as you're looking around for information about this like, random you know, parking meter you got. Um, other example is all the other lifters out there. You know, if there's 10 people implementing the same architecture in 10 different tools, uh, a couple of them are going to be really good at that architecture. And you can look at what they're doing and possibly try and automate uh, some of the uh, semantic, uh, uh, semantic information that you're trying to implement and move it from their code to your code. Um, so how would that happen? Uh, if you look at an emulator, it's, they're really freaking simple for the simple ones. Uh, all that's important is there's a giant switch statement. It might be a table, whatever. Um, and the basic blocks uh, in that switch statement are really flat and they're, they're either just calling a really simple function or they, they just inline that simple function. Um, and it's gonna be either calling abstract functions for doing memory operations or it's just gonna straight up access memory. And like this is really easy code to analyze. There's no loops, there's no, there's no nothing. There's like a hot path and a, there's a fast path and a slow path. Uh, and the fast path is super easy to analyze and the slow path is things like debug information that you do not care about uh, for the things you want to lift for things like constant propagation. So uh, with that in mind, uh, one thing you could do is just have your intermediate representation uh, that you've lifted to, uh, have an evaluator, uh, and the evaluator just produces like a verifier for input, output, is this good? Uh, and then you generate a ton of inputs and outputs with your emulator that you found um, and then you have a fuzzer, uh, and nobody wants to try fuzzing stuff, so like, ideally you want to bin it, and then like, prioritize it, and then like, only look at the stuff you care about. Uh, but that's like, a hard, annoying problem. Because um, like, th there's things you can do that are like, reasonable, but it's, the thing you're trying to do is like, basically diff the code that you have versus the emulator that you think is good. Um, and fuzzers are capable of doing that, but like not great for it, especially if you don't have uh, feedback. So like ideally you want to run the emulator in AFL or something, and uh, there's potentially another option. Um, so there's this thing called symbolic execution that has like a gigantic uh, academic footprint and industry footprint, to be honest. Uh, and there's been some nice tools released in the last decade or so that have gotten progressively better and progressively better licensed. Um, so why don't we just check equivalence with Z3 and like have it solve all of our problems? Um, so the way that looks is you, know, you, you have a second lifter that lifts from the intermediate language that is common across all your stuff, uh, just straight to Z3, or straight to SMT, but whatever. But everybody's gonna use Z3 anyway. Um, and so you lift one instruction from the target image uh, where you think that instruction is not being uh, lifted correctly uh, to Z3 and you lift the entire simulated instruction from the emulator straight to Z3. And then you have an assignment where you, know, you set the input state. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the swap instruction, which swaps the nibbles on A, 
uh, register. Uh, and I'm saying, hey, uh, the initial state of A is the same as the, it is in the emulator. Uh, I pulled that address out of uh, Binja. Uh, there's no symbol for that one, but whatever. Um, and you know, the final state is different in the emulator and in my lift. Um, and then you, you just say, like, give me a model that matches those equations and constraints. And this kind of works. Like, you can just run it against some really simple code, and it'll tell you that, hey, you're, you're not, what, wait, wait, wait. Let, let's just pretend we didn't see that, uh, huh? Uh, but like here, here it worked, because here we have this really simple operation, and it's just like a, you know, it's literally a SAT problem, so like this one uh, proves that they are equivalent. Um, I'm also doing a thing here where I'm like using a binge feature where I'm using wide registers to uh, deal with the fact that uh, 8051 likes to write code in C, but like there's no 32-bit values, uh, so they have all these operations that you want to inline. Um, so the binary, the IL patching I showed earlier, um, uh, that's why I'm proving equivalence here because I just wrote a bunch of ghetto IL patches and I want them to be correct. Um, so like yeah, this looks kind of promising and oh wait, so like there is a massive body of knowledge on like how to do equivalence checking using all kinds of symbolic execution tools. It goes back a long way. Uh, it's really intimidating to look at it first. Um, and like, it's really easy to be unproductive, which is why I had like the initial section at the start about like, here's what our actual goals are. We wanna get to the point where we're doing useful RE, so we can get to the point where we had like a read, write, execute primitive, and then write a debugger, so we have a hardware in the loop debugger and we don't have to mess around with our horrible like lifter code uh, that's broken. Um, because to summarize the like, what does symbolic execution give us? Uh, like program, program analysis is a search problem we're doing a search on program states and transitions between them, and we want to find where some property holds. Um, and like the Z3 is like a super generic solver, so you know the, the nice thing about Binge is that it does things like SSA for me now. Uh, sorry, it, it does things like SSA transformation and like value set assignment uh, and uh, SSA. I'm using the wrong acronym. Um, it does a bunch of stuff, algorithms for me that are like fast and actually terminate. Uh, which the generic solver does not necessarily do. So if you, if you pass it something like a multiplication, it won't say, I don't know. It'll say, it'll just sit and eat uh, memory if that multiplication is doing modulo exponentiation or something. Um, so you can try and solve this by having a massive amount of heuristics piled on top of your black box solver, but practically that's, you know, going back to our workflow of we want to get some tools up fast, we want to ha have those tools be productive, uh, that does not help my workflow because that is a massive sinkhole uh, and it's not super reusable if your heuristics are targeted at a specific emulator or a specific platform. So, um, yeah, the, the other thing is that we're like, when we're ch checking equivalents, we're checking for, uh, you know, for all, for all paths through the program, this property holds, uh, which is an expensive problem to verify, where like either you exhaustively search it, which on an 8-bit architecture you might be able to, uh, or you like transform it to a different form where it's easier to solve, and like maybe the uh, black box uh, tool that you have, whatever SMT solver you use, does that for you, but maybe it doesn't. Um, so the actual uh, tool chain ends up looking like this, where you have the emulator on the left, uh, and you use the. Uh, I'm using Binja, so I'm using it to transform, uh, lift things from like ARM to LLIL to SSA. Uh, blast SSA straight into Z3. Um, and on the other hand, I have the uh, 8051 binary, and I have the really sketchy lifter that I quickly wrote. Um, and I'm lifting that to LLIL SSA Z3. And then there's this weird part where, like, remember all those weird things that you had to do with, like, memory mapping to make things work? So, like, the emulator has its own memory map, and you have your own emulator ma memory map. And, like, the emulator probably does things you don't care about, like bank switching. Um, which, if you implement, your, your analysis gets more annoying. Um, so what you have to do is map both of those abstractions back to each other to something common. So either you map your custom memory map to whatever the em emulator is doing or vice versa. Um, so if you look at the code that like, I control uh, and that is shared across my projects, um, I've got the like, central stuff is all shared across projects and that's good. Everything outside the blue lines is unique to a project, that's kind of bad. Um, 
The problem I ran into is actually that uh, the top half of the common code is uh, under development and like actively getting better, which means I use a nightly branch, uh, which means it's shifting under me as I'm implementing the top code and the bottom code. So I'm writing a lifter and a second lifter from LILSSA to Z3 um, while the code is changing. Like, it is three things changing at the same time is bad. Uh, the good news is that when it does work, uh, it proves equivalence for some degree of assurance. It's not a very high quality assurance. Um, bad news is that for most instructions, it does not actually work uh, for the implementation I did. So that's why I went over the like stupid fuzzer approach where like at some point you're just like, screw it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run a for loop. Um, it's not going to have any fancy symbolic execution transforms. There's no like Galois connections here. Uh, but it's going to terminate. I know when it's going to terminate. Um, and you test things with a for loop. So um, basically, what, what is the like? What, what is the takeaway here? Um, there's a lot of interesting problems in reverse engineering that require like purely static reverse engineering until you get good enough at it to get to the next stage. Uh, because there's a lot of fun stuff after you get good at statically reverse engineering a particular platform. Um, that is only accessible if you get past that initial hurdle. Uh, there's a lot of cool tools that come out that try to help you with that stage uh, by having like a common IL that you can read easily so you don't have to learn PowerPC instructions uh, or you know, there's worse things out there uh, to actually get your job done. So it is legitimately like there is opportunity here to write better tools uh, and there are some things that work. So the main things I learned from doing this for enough of a tool chain to improve 8051 reversing to the point where it was better for me than IDA, because uh, there's a lot of things that have bugged me in IDA for doing memory management and so on for 8051. Um, the big thing is that like horrible approximations, as long as they recover your control flow and instruction decodings uh, and uh, get your like switch statements and get you to structs, approximations are fine. Uh, partial lifting, where you only lift like 20 instructions correctly and the rest are horribly wrong, turns out that's also actually fine. So like, if there are, if there are the 20 instructions you need to get the like, uh, AT command table to make sense to you, perfect. Um, the emulator is an oracle to uh, kind of sanity check your work. Uh, that kind of works, but you have to map. You either need to find an emulator that closely matches uh, your model of the processor, which is driven by the tool you're using to analyze it, um, or you have to do a bunch of mapping back between the two uh, to use it as an equivalence checker. Um, well, equivalence fuzzer. Uh, full equivalence checking versus an emulator, um, it runs into the same problem where the two mismatch, uh, and it also runs into the fact that like you're relying on a partial lifter too. Uh, so the thing I had to do is uh, like play with the compiler options, switch to a simpler architecture, I think like ARM, 32-bit ARM on OS uh, GCC uh, produced like the most correct, uh, most correct lifting, um, and seemed to lift the mo seemed to be able to check the most instructions uh, as passing for whatever that meant. Um, but yeah, so as far as speeding up toolchain bring up, uh, I think as an experiment, uh, this was educational, but compared to just reading the reference manual uh, after you've done it enough times, so you can figure out which instructions are important and just lift those and nothing else. Um, if you're not familiar with reference manuals and you don't know the rough architecture and which instructions matter to you to lift and which ones don't, uh, you don't want to be implementing the emulator from scratch while you have like actual firmware to reverse. Um, this stuff helps. Uh, if you're familiar, if you can write a little lifter in like a couple of days for something reasonable, it's it's kind of a wash. So I definitely got nerd sniped with this, and I think there is a lot of value in it in the future. Um, but don't uh, use a nightly build for your core-like lifting step. So uh, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Why are you doing this is acceptable. Um, so for a lot of architectures, there are like um, machine-oriented descriptor files for the environment. And I was wondering if 
uh, whilst you were looking into this automation thing, if you'd looked at all at automating, um, sort of converting memory maps from, say, system view descriptors or anything like that? System view is cheating because they have really good uh, specs available. Uh, ARM v7 and v8 might also be cheating. I don't know about, well, so I, I think for the, uh, if you're looking at reversing application code where you have like a snippet of an application that you pulled from a firmware somewhere, um, you don't want the like hardware or the memory maps. You want the like command parser and which commands are implemented. Uh, so if you're just looking for like the basic C code, um, I don't think the, unless you're getting like an actual instruction spec, uh, like, like if they have a reference manual where they copy and paste something that might be a semi-formal spec that you can pull out and interpret, uh, I think that would be productive, but not like just memory maps or IO registers, what have you. Thanks. Awesome. No more questions? Okay, then thank the speaker again.